First, I'd like to give everyone, wish everyone auspicious greetings. And so today, according to the announcement, before I before I give the speak in the teaching, I'd like to make an impart an important announcement. And this is that tomorrow is supposed to be the day that we finish the teaching, but in terms of the uh, topic of the teaching, there's still a lot left to talk about. So I thought perhaps we should uh, lengthen the teaching by adding an additional day. But since we're doing the teaching over the internet, even if we change the, the time, I don't think it's going to give you all that much difficulty. It's mainly, I have contacted the Shadras last night, and I asked them, and they all said it was okay. And so that also made me feel a bit relieved. So today, the has increased from being seven days long to eight days long. And for Mesut, it's a little bit difficult, but there is some work, but but I think if I can teach everything completely, I've got that sort of uh, that excitement to do this or that wish to do that. And so we will uh, lengthen the teaching by one day. So today we will continue where we left off yesterday and continue speaking about the topic of the Dharma becoming the Dharma. When we say the Dharma must become the Dharma, if we talk about it in a simple way, it means our Dharma practice needs to be needs to fit with the Dharma, or it has to have the same meaning as taught in the Dharma. And so that's how we should understand it. And so in order for that to happen, we must uh, identify the impediments to abandon and the favorable antidotes and, and uh, make the Dharma become the Dharma. And what the impediments to abandon are, are as I explained yesterday, and so for the second, the favorable antidotes that we must apply are the uh, are the there are the methods for the making the mind go or making the Dharma become the Dharma. You can talk about them the favorable antidotes or the methods. So what we need what helps us if we uh, if we want uh, Dharma to become the Dharma, the most important is to meditate, uh, or the most beneficial is to meditate on death and impermanence, karmic cause and effect, and the faults of samsara. It's those three. So Gampopa here said, it said, it is important to contemplate death and impermanence, the root or foundation of the Dharma. Then it is important to contemplate karmic cause and effect and the defects of samsara. If you do not gain certainty in them, you may look like a Dharma practitioner, but you are not. When they take root in your mind, you will be able to utterly cast off all the affairs of this life and Dharma practice will come. And so this is what he said. These are like the most critical points for the Dharma becoming the Dharma, are these three, three points that are described above. And the first of them is, uh, meditating on death and impermanence imper is important. Uh, as the Semba Chempo Shunu Jalchok wrote in his commentary on the lamp for the path to enlightenment, if you do not develop this attitude or if this does not take root in your mind, no matter how many teachings you listen to or teach, no matter how much you meditate, you will, you will, uh, you are still someone focused on this life. Atisha said. So does Atisha, who said this. 
However, since all monastics are deficient on this point, he said the pith instruction is to first meditate on impermanence. And the person who said this again is Atishan. What he said is, our we monks, so, so it says a, um, they're using an old word, bande, for monks. Actually, and this is the still, still the word that they use in the Theravada uh, school. So all of our monks, so all of us are deficient in this. We don't have enough of this. And this is that the Dharma we don't have enough is the practice of d- contemplating death and impermanence. And this is a big fault that we have. And so when we, and so when we want to meditate, was it meditating on impermanence first? Is a really critical point. And when we've meditated upon that, you will gain three three dharmas. The first is certainty in this root. The second is that you're grabbing to this life. Will you will let go of grabbing to this life? And the third is that you will think that the fu- uh, future lives are more important than this one. These will come together. So when you have when you death and impermanence take root in your being from one dis- perspective. It has gives you the. Uh, it'll bring you the certainty that you're going to die. And the second thing is that you're going to let go of the clinging to this life, which means you're going to be uh, become revolted by this life. And you, then you also have the thought that uh, that you will have the thought that future lives are more important than this one. And these three will all come together. And for this reason. So among these three, um, so the first two are the first two are to be practiced by the lesser type of individual. The third is primarily to be practiced by middling individuals, as it, as it says. Now, when we talk about greater and lesser individuals, we shouldn't understand it as meaning three different individuals. We should understand it as three different capa- levels of capacity of the mind. And so we need to train ourselves and proceed by going from train. We need to tra- go by tra- go ahead by training ourselves to go from the lesser individual to the greater individual. For example, if you're a weightlifter or a bodybuilder, um, and so, so, these, so these are people are training to build up bulk and to build up muscles, to build up strength. And the plans that begin, they begin first with one or two kilos, then gradually you increase it to five or 10 kilos. And then in the eventually you'll be able to lift a hundred kilos, right? So it's the same as that. You have to train yourself to, if you, if, if you, uh, if you, uh, and if you begin by trying to lift 300 kilos, you won't be able to do it, you'll break your back. Not only will you not be able to do it, you'll, uh, you'll hurt yourself. But one thing that someone all has to know, know here, one point that everyone has to know is these four dharmas of Gampopa, it's a well known that in general, the four dharmas of Gampopa can be combined with Atisha's three types of individuals. Gampopa wrote in a string, a string of jewels, the Supreme Path in verse, what he wrote is, the stages of the path of the three individuals that teach what is taught in all vehicles are the main highway of all the nobles of the three times, explained by the four uh, by the four dharmas. So this is what he says. And so also, Jigung Choba Chikten Sumgun wrote in his clear meaning a commentary on the four dharmas. I shall write about the four dharmas, the advice of Atisha and the quintessence of Gampopa's intent. And so from this point, the four dharmas, it's very clear that they can be, the four dharmas can be combined with the three types of individuals taught in the Kadampa. But in this text that we are talking about now, it's like we talk about the middle, the practice of the middling level in the uh, in the uh, in the section of the 
so the, well, the practice of middling individuals explained in the passage on the lesser individual, and the practice of the greater individuals is explained in the passage on the middling, or they're interleaved, such as when the practice of the lesser and middling individuals are explained in the passage on the greater. But I think really, I wonder, is there actually any difference in the meaning? And so when the reason why these, uh, uh, these uh, different levels of the individ individuals are mix are, are mixed up or they the order is changed is because Gampopo was very skilled at teaching in uh, his individuals as is explained in his life and the stories of his life and liberation and he had many different types of students he had scholars who were very who were very learned in the philosophy and there are also great meditators who had great longing to practice meditation there were householders who were heedful of karmic cause and effect, and there were even illiterate goat herds and elderly men and women who were so old that they were approaching death. And so when Gampa Rinpoche taught them the Dharma, what he had for this one point of the Dharma becoming the Dharma, he had many different ways of speaking about it. One way was to uh, teach the, with, in terms of the correct worldly view and say, this is the way to turn away from the lower realms and reach the higher realms. That was one way. And when some people first met Kampopa, they had already developed the wish to seek liberation and had already had the wish to go forth and take the vows of a novice or a bhikshu. And so for them, it wasn't wasn't in the sense that oh don't think about liberation. You first have to have the uh, uh, have the uh, vehicle of achieving the gods and humans. It's no it wasn't necessary to insist on this. Instead, he would teach the correct worldly view and the transcendent view of achieving liberation together, and teach the paths of the lesser and the middling individuals together. And with people such as Che Palmodrupa and Dusan Kempa. They had already reached a high level of study with the Kadampa Geshes. And they had the feeling, the wish that to make Bodhicitta and Mahamudra the core of their practice. So when they met um, Gampopa, and Gampopa taught them how the Dharma should become the Dharma, he would instruct them in the practices of the lesser, middling, greater individuals simultaneously. So that's another way he taught. In particular, in this text that we are speak, uh, speaking about he, on this occasion, so how what is it? <laughs> so it's probably not something that Gampapa wrote himself. Nor was it something that some learned student of his uh, put uh, prepared and put in a proper order either. So instead, what it was is that there are the critical points of how he it's, it's, uh, instructed students to in the way that they needed, and a student with a good memory recorded them accurately. And so this is a really important point if we think about it actually. To give an example, if we have a, a loving mother who has nine children, that mother knows from experience what size each of them are and what food they like. She knows this from her experience, and because she knows this, she gives each of those children the clothes that fit and food that they like. If you have like a stepmother who doesn't really care about them, she'd give them all the same clothes and uh, all the same food, and she'd hardly look at them at all. Similarly, when an authentic guru nurtures students, and they're like a mother who's uh, taking care, loving mother taking care of children. 
and teach the stages of practice appropriate to each individual student. Teach, and they teach them to each individual students. They know what will be most helpful and beneficial for the students. So understanding this, they, they nurture them with great love. And so then, oh, I don't care if it hurt, helps you or not, or if I don't know or not. I don't have any of the Dharma. It's like, and they teach the Dharma as if throwing rocks. Then they wouldn't bring much benefit to sentient beings. We always talk about the qualities of the, of the ten powers of a Buddha. And among the ten powers, then many of these are are the ability to know the capacities and natures of students, right? So I think that teaching the Dharma in the way that fits with students' natures, capacities, and interests is probably the ultimate reason why we can say that the Buddha has great compassion. So in brief, No matter what level we're on, greater, middle, or lesser, lesser, we can be the four dharmas of Gampopa can be can be used to teach the critical points of practice. And so it's a very vast meaning, but a very short words, and main points that are easy to keep in mind. And this is that sort of an incredible dharma, and so I think that that's the sort of uh, teaching that it is. So here we're that we need something we need to talk about here is this is the method for Dharma to become the Dharma. And so the first way I described first method I described yesterday, it's meditating upon I talked about already. And the second is meditating on karmic cause and effect and the faults of samsara. So in this uh, text on the four dharmas that we're speaking about now, death and, and impermanence is a bit at a bit more extent, a bit more length, and karmic cause and effect and the faults of samsara are, are talked about more more concisely. And so, yesterday when I was speaking about the way that dharma becomes the dharma. <clears throat> I, des I described I've, I described the um, meditating on dharmic uh, death and impermanence as one facet and meditating upon uh, uh, karmic cause and effect and the faults of samsara as a second. But I think it's also good to talk about each of them individually. And the reason for this is that so because this uh, talking about the faults of samsara, it mixes in the practice of the that are common with the individual uh, in, middling type of individuals uh, so it's good to separate it out to separate it out and so today I'll talk about them in terms of separating them into three points so I've already spoken about death and impairments so I'll talk about how is it that are the Dharma become the Dharma in terms of meditating on karma or by way of karma, meditating on karma cause and effect as it says in the root text. This is the text, the four dharmas in brief. It says, when you die, your self-aware wisdom will only be accompanied by your bad and uh, good and bad karma. It is impossible to encounter, gar encounter karma you have not done. It is impossible for what you have done, karma you have done, to dissipate. If you were born in the three lower realms because of your unvirtuous actions, how much will you suffer? And so this is basically, uh, this is the teaching on karmic cause and effect. And then in terms of meditating on, on the defects of samsara, samsara in order for dharma to become dharma, this is uh, read in the text, it says, the best is the uh, human god realms. Now here there is a uh, typo in the Tibetan text, but it says the best of human and god realms, but even there, there is the suffering of birth, aging, death, looking for where you lack, protecting what you have, crossing paths with hostile enemies, and losing loving friends, 
For the gods, the suffering of dying and falling is 16 times greater than that of the incessant hell. No matter where you take birth in the six realms, there is only suffering. Until you feel this and reach a level of disgust, the Dharma will not become the Dharma. So when we talk about the suffering of dying and falling is uh, 16 times greater than that of the incessant hell. Now we look for a source, a source in the uh, the suffering does 16 times greater than the incessant hell. This is, I looked for the, or, the source of this and I looked in the way of the Bodhisattva it talks about how it is great, but it doesn't give that spe spe specific figure. When you talk about the Dharma becoming the Dharma, in Dhapa Rinpoche's other uh, uh, texts and in his other, uh, so, and in the commentaries written by his students, there is some, it, it says, it's well known that he teaches primarily for those lesser individuals who are interested in the uh, pleasures of gods and humans, but it's not, that's not categorically so because, um, and because he also talks about the way that the Dharma becomes Dharma for the greater and the middling individuals. Also in in Gampapa's uh, collected works, there is the collection of Dharma, the great collection of Dharma talks. And this says, there are two parts of Dharma to becoming Dharma, Dharma becoming worldly Dharma and becoming the worldly Dharma of Dharma. So there are these two, two ways for Dharma to become the Dharma. And so regarding Dharma becoming worldly Dharma, because of understanding death and impermanence and because of understanding and believing in karmic results, you fear the suffering of the lower realms in the next realm. Then all the positive virtues you do are from a desire to block the gateway to the lower realms in the next lifetime. You definitely wish to achieve the pure body of a god or human in the higher realms, the pleasures of the gods, the pleasures of humans and the enjoyments of the gods. Everything you do for that sake becomes the worldly dharma of peace and happiness for yourself alone. And so what this understands is that means that we have to understand that So that we and we are afraid. It seems that we need to make efforts in order to achieve. So this is very clear that this is taught in terms of joining with a path for the lesser individual. So in other, so next it talks about the. So one is in terms of the Dharma become the Dharma in terms of teaching and the Dharma become the Dharma of Nirvana. So this is understanding the faults of all of samsara, the not having any attachment or desire for the uh, body or God or pleasures of a gods and humans, and understanding that in the end it all leads to the lower realms. So you un you understand that samsara is like a pit of fire. You know, it is like a prison, a dungeon, pitch darkness and a filthy cesspool. You know that samsara is a ocean of suffering. You believe it with such certainty that you have no attachment or wish for any samsaric pleasures at all. And so you want to free yourself swiftly from samsara. When you want to be liberated, all the dharma you practice, you are seeking the nirvana of peace and happiness for yourself alone. Because of understanding the faults of the listeners in Pratyeka Buddha's enlightenment and of the foundation vehicle, the positive accumulations of purification to do become the nir nirvana. And that's the way the dharma becomes the dharma. And here, but here in the recordings of the dharma talks, I think there are a few, um, a few, problems in the text and it picks at one point it the text is it seems like some words are missing it talks about seeing the faults of the listeners and particulars and I'm wondering if there's some sort of a mistake in the text here because when it's, we're talking about the 
when we're talking because in the next section we'll talk about the uh, Dharma become the path then at that point only then does the seeing the um, the the just the question of seeing the faults to the Nirvana the listeners and project of Buddhas when we talk about and so at that point there's also at that section there's also a point on seeing the faults of the listeners and and project of Buddhas enlightenment and so I think that there's a bit of a problem and I think that maybe there's a, the order has mixed up there was a mistake in, in when this re teaching was recorded so that's what I think it is so in brief So in terms of there's these two ways that the Dharma becomes the Dharma. There's the worldly way that the Dharma becomes the worldly and the nirvanic way that Dharma becomes the Dharma. And so the nirvanic way is seeing the faults of difficulties of all samsara just produced by crime and afflictions. Then we have no desire for any of the bounties of samsara. See samsara as like a pit of fire and to develop the wish to free ourselves from samsara. Then in all the virtue you do, you're seeking to be free of samsara and achieve nirvana. And so this is explaining the point in connection with the practice of the middling individual. So next. So at this point, when you're talking about the Dharma becoming the Dharma, It's like the teaching, the the way that the Dharma can become, become the Dharma. It's taught in terms of both the way for both the ways for the lesser and for the middling individuals. So, as well known, it generally the Dharma become the Dharma is generally combined with the more people describe it as being related to the practice of the lesser individuals. Individuals, but here it is combined with both the practice of the lesser individual and that of the middling individual. And later, later on in that text, when it speaks about the uh, the Dharma becoming the uh, the path, this is generally spoken about as combined with the practice of the middling individual. So the and so it is with the wish to achieve the uh, liberation of the uh, the liberation and enlightenment of the listeners in the Prateka Buddhas, and it's primarily talked about in terms of the middling individual, but here, but here in this, in, in that text, it's, it's, it's uh, combined with the practice of the Mahayana. And so that is also an important for, point for all of you to understand. So today, when you're talking about the karmic cause and effect, We've spoken a lot about karma, cause and effect, and so forth. But the main thing is, is uh, I've been speaking about the uh, talking about the karma cause uh, about the faults of samsara and if I, or karma cause and effect. And if I think if I share some of my own thoughts about that, hmm. So generally, when we talk about karma, cause and effect, we all have our own ideas or understandings or opinions about what karma, cause and effect mean. We normally say that if you do virtue, then you have a good result. If you do non-virtues, then you'll have a bad results. And that's, that's what we think. But, but that way of thinking about karma cause and effect and the relation of karma cause and effect is, is really extremely narrow and simplistic. For example, me, many people think if I work hard. If I can work hard, I'll be able to lift myself up, raise myself up, and become someone well known. And people will, and someone whom people will uh, respect and look up to. 
And if we even, people are even more bold than that. Uh, if I can put a bit of work in and get some good opportunities, then I can become the richest person in the world. So people do think this. But some people, but some people really don't need to work hard at all. And they don't even have much natural intelligent or intelligence or education, but they're born in a rich family. And from, from the time that they're very time that they're born, they have uh, wealth and riches and fame and so forth. And so we might think, and we might think to ourselves, well, how did that happen? Why is that? It's possible we might think so. So if we actually look at with our, our real lives, if we join it with the actual situations of this life, to give an example of that, many people think, they think, I've never drunk alcohol, I've never smoked. I've always taken a great interest in health and exercise and everything. And so I'm not going to get any uh, terrible in this. No, this is what they think. But someday, if they get um, some sort of a serious illness, it's like they are amazed and astounded. They, they're, they're overwhelmed. They have, don't know what to do. Now, people are completely the opposite. They spend their entire lives drinking alcohol, smoking. And they're only junk food. But some of them live to be over 100. And when we see that, uh, this life, we think to ourselves, life just isn't fair. So how can there be karmic cause and effect? So we might think this, right? So why is it that we think that? It's because we think about karma in such a simplistic and easy way. Karma cause and effect. Karma cause and effect is not as easy as just adding one to one and getting two. In the actual, in actual fact, karma cause and effect. Not only is it not not only that the positive that the good acts bring positive results. It's not so, so easy. Generally, if you plant wheat, you get root, wheat. So we say that, 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 that karma, that the way it works is that you know, karma cause and effect is unfailing, but it's not just the, there aren't just people planting rice. So in this world, there are many. So we're kind of like the frog and the whale. And we take our own narrow view and take that narrow view and look at the, the examine the situation. So if we think about it in that way, then there is no way that it can actually be quite right. All of us sentient beings are dependent, uh, live in dependence upon one, each other. The, the path of the breath moving from one to another is all the same. In particular, as I, some, when I spoke about this, uh, this vast universe of ours, about how it is incredibly, inconceivably vast and, and, and so forth. And in this a huge universe, all of the beings within are directly or indirectly related. We're all entirely related. And that those that relation is so vast that is so vast that we can hardly conceive or understand it. And when we think about it in this way, if we think about like like a game like chess where you have white and white and black pieces. You probably don't know that. But in Chinese 
but are lower like the Japanese uh, game uh, Go, uh, Go, where you have white and black pieces. Or in, in, in the West, you have chess. And so you play chess or Go. And so when we talk about the uh, old Kadampa masters who counted white and black stones, so this is what we're talking about. So each rock or each piece has its own capability and its own power, its own function. It has their own capacity. And so for each, so each piece is an important part of the whole assembly of all the pieces or the arrangement of all the pieces. So in be between each of the pieces, there they, they one benefits the other and some uh, impede the others. So if you put one piece in the wrong place, then you mess up the entire game or you influence the entire game. Similarly, this and this universe and in the very least in this earth is like the 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 game like a chess or it's like now with a with a game you only have a few pieces it's not so easy but if you think about it in terms of this earth there there are hundreds or millions of thousands of times as many pe uh, as many as there are pieces in a test game and so and so we are all sentient beings who have known each other and, and been connected in previous lifetimes and so there there are so many sentient beings that have been connected and so there are there are all of these, like this big net web that is all in, interconnected and dependent upon each other. And so within this, and since we're all living in this um, mandala like this, so from each sentient between each mention, there is a, there are connections of harming or hurting or help, harming or helping each other. We have the capacity of affecting each other. So if we, so we normally we think that when we perform an act that it's going to produce a result, it's, it's something it, it's not it's not going to be so simplistic where there's going to be something that we inv, um, that we can see with our eyes. It's actually extremely complicated. If it were so easy that we could see, and so that we go in the direction that we wanted, if it, only in what in terms of what we could see. So if we so we think about it in terms of and this becomes a way where we think about it only in terms of ourselves, but actually in terms of how it really is. In fact, it's not like that. The sun doesn't just the sun doesn't just shine for just a few people. The sun, the sun rising and setting every day. It's just because it's just the way things naturally happen. It's not that it's done something specifically for the sake of a few people. But we usually think that, oh, it's shining for me. Basically, between ourselves and other sentient beings, there is a, a link. It's a link of being able to help or harm each other. So it's like a, a mutual benefit. It goes in both ways. And so in terms of the uh, the connections of death and impermanence, like we're also um, like mothers and children. Or there seems to be like there's a vert vertical connection between everyone uh, in terms of time. And so the karma cause and effect goes from lifetime to lifetime, continue. And so the result happens only. Uh, it takes it takes eventually, but it doesn't happen necessarily in the course of this life the way we think it should. In order for the result to ripen, it takes time. For example, if we plant a, a if we plant the the sprout of a tree, then it's only uh, eight, nine, or ten years later. Only then do we have a, a tree. If you plant today, you don't get the tree today. For example, if we do a virtuous action. We work hard and 
put effort into it or work in it. In order to achieve, it definitely takes a certain amount of time in order for the result to occur, to really to ripen. But many people, they're not afraid to put effort in, but they're really impatient for the results, and they have great hopes. They have, they hope they ha- have too high hopes, and then get upset. But sometimes, no, the, when you, if it takes a longer time, you get actually a bigger result. For example, in this earth, there are there are jewels such as diamonds and so forth. They don't just take ten or a hundred years to form. They take millions, millions or tens of millions of years before uh, form, and only then do they actually become uh, jewels. If it takes that long for one rock to turn into a precious jewel, then of course it takes that long for our karmic results to ripen. It takes certainly it takes a, it's a fixed amount of time. If, if we want to have a, va- a powerful result happen, of course it's going to take that long to happen. No matter what work we're doing, what acts we're doing, and particularly when we're doing virtuous actions, we definitely have to be patient for the result and have a long-term result, not think that it's going to happen immediately. We need to be patient and have the belief that there that a result will come. If we actually are someone who has belief in karma, cause and effect, you'd probably never worry that you wouldn't get a result out of your virtuous actions. Also, nor that you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, th- uh, fool yourself and think that, oh, the uh, misdeeds I've done in the past aren't going to ripen upon me. You would never think like that. So for this reason. So people need to take like that more vaster view and a longer term view and have a, like, take a long, uh, have a long perspective, a long term perspective. And so what this per- that the person who does that would do, they think about this life as being for the, considered as like being for the sake of future life. Thinking that from a small, uh, a small act now has a, bad, a, a big result. It's a, for example, because this life is short and the future lives are, are long. So if you do a small, and so they'd analyze it and they'd say, okay, this lifetime, uh, uh, so you have to take a long life. For example, if you want to go fishing, you need to have a long line, as it says on board lines. If you have only a short line, you're never going to get it. And the longer your fishing line is, then you can uh, then you can cast it further. And then the further you can uh, cast it, then you have, you have more of a chance of getting uh, catching fish. If we don't do that like that, and we, no matter what virtue we do, we think that we need to have an immediate result. And some sort of a profit that we can get, some visible that uh, that other people can't see. We might waste our entire lifetimes for the sake of some tiny benefit, and then at the end, we're unable to get anything better than anything else. And if we can't turn out better than other people, then what point is it? You work hard, and at the end, then you don't become a, a an important person as you wished. In addition, not becoming uh, there's no point in that. So for that reason, karma cause and effect is not where I think. Oh, I need to become like this as just a single person. And virtue and non-virtue is it? It's like this is virtue and this is non-virtue. It's not something that we can decide. And we also think that we should do something to benefit other sentient beings. 
And I think that the the what the acts I'm doing are okay. But does that actually go with how things actually are? It's really difficult for that to really go to with, to, to match how things actually are. For example, if you're thinking about medical work, if you're wor the work as a doctor, a doctor's work is actually a good work that practically benefits other sentient um, beings in a practical way. For, so for those, and if you have like a, a mother who sends her child to go get a med medical education, regardless of whether the child has any interest or, or any ability. And so one way of thinking about it is the mother has done well for the child. But if another way, another way of thinking is that the mother has been prioritizing her own way of looking at and seeing things, but she isn't looking at it from every direction. Similarly, we usually think that we're doing things to benefit others. But we're taking our own limited intelligence and our own uh, limited motivations and acting on them. We don't think about whether it's actually benefiting others. We think we have the we have the idea that it's going to benefit others, and we do that. It's because we're only deciding for ourselves. We aren't thinking about the. We aren't including the other person in our in our uh, evaluation of whether there's benefit or not. So when we do virtue, we need to think about in every, from everything. We need to do something that is going to be beneficial for everyone. Otherwise, if we just do it as it seems to us and just the way we think about it, that alone will not help. But we ordinary people are unable to see or to realize every situation from all directions and every angle. And so what we can do is this. So we can rely upon the direction on their advice and the direction that they give us. And among that, we can also rely on the words of the Buddha and practice and uh, practice and tell about what to do and what not to do. And the reason for this is that karma cause and effect is so subtle that only omniscient wisdom is able to know it. No one else can. So for that reason, we need to value the words of the Buddha and practice according to that is like the basis or the critical point for not mistaking what should be done and what should be given up. So everyone just sort of kind of takes it for granted about what we should do. And we think about what is it uh, about what's going to do and we think kind of externally, but we actually need to look in terms of the actual situation. What is the, What are the words of the Buddha? And we need to look at the uh, teachings of the great beings and say, is my thought right or not? Is it? Is my way of acting of what I'm doing and what I'm giving up, not doing, is that right? There is a, there is the teachings of the a teaching from Kaju forefathers. There's a lot to, uh, to say if we think about karmic cause and effect in detail, but the most important point they say is, is looking at your own faults and looking at others' qualities. This is the most critical point for doing what you should do and giving up what must be given up. And the reason for this is, as I said before, 